Hello, and welcome to another video with Kills of Whispers ASMR. In this video, I'm going to be reading from this book that I've just recently got, which is Tales for Twilight. And it's basically um, 200 years of different ghost stories from Scotland. Um, I thought this is a perfect opportunity because I've had quite a few people request this, um, like her doing ghost stories and stuff. And so I thought it's Halloween. So I'm going to read one, one tale in particular. Um, takes a while to get into it, but it's quite a good story. So um, before I get started, just if you do enjoy the video, please do consider liking and subscribing. Um, it means a lot. So, without further ado, let me just find the right page. There we go. So, this one is called A Tale for Twilight, um, same as the name of the book, and it is by Anonymous. As far as I am myself concerned with the following facts, I am fully prepared to vouch for their authenticity, but the reliance to be placed upon other parts of the recital must be at the option of the reader or his conviction of their apparent truth. I am neither over credulous nor sceptic in matters of a superhuman nature. I would neither implicitly confide in unsupported assertions nor dissent from well-attested truths, but at the same time I must confess that, although rather inclined to be a non-believer, I have sometimes listened to details of supernatural occurrences so borne out by concurrent testimony as almost to fix my wavering faith. It is now nearly thirty years since I was a partial witness to the following circumstance at my father's house in Edinburgh. And though during that period, time and foreign climates may have thinned my locks and furrowed my brow a little, they have neither effaced one item of its details from my memory, nor warped the vivid impressions which it left upon my recollection. It was in the winter of 1798 the occurrence took place. I remember the time distinctly by the circumstance of my father's being absent with his regiment, which had been ordered to Ireland to reinforce the troops then engaged in quelling the insurgents, who had arisen in rebellion in the summer of that year. There was an old retainer of our house, who used to, at the time, be very frequently about us. She had nursed my younger brother and myself, and the family felt for her all the attachment due to an old and faithful inmate. Her husband had been a sergeant in the army of General Burgoyne and was killed at the attack on Ilencia de Acalcantara in the early part of his late majesty's reign when the British crossed the Portuguese frontier in order to check the advance of the Spaniards upon Al Alentejo. And perhaps this circumstance created an additional sympathy towards her father, towards her in my mother's breast. I remember her appearance distinctly, her neatly plaited cap and scarlet ribbon, her white fringed apron and purple quilted petticoat are all as fresh in my memory as yesterday, and though nearly sixty at the period I speak of, she retained all the she retained all the activity and good humour of sixteen. Her strength was but a little impaired, and as she was but slightly affected, slightly affected by fatigue or watching, she was in the habit of engaging herself as a nurse tender in numerous respectable families, who were equally preposed in her favour. The winter was drawing near a close and we were beginning to be anxious for the return of my father, who is expected home about this time, when old nurse 
as we always called her, came to tell us of an engagement she had got to attend a young gentleman who was lying dangerously ill in one of the streets of the old town. For at that time, few of the fine palaces of the new town had been even thought of, and many a splendid street now covers what was then green fields and waving meadows. She men mentioned that a physician who had always been kind to her had recommended her to this duty. But as the patient was in a most critical state, the manner of her attendance was to be very particular. She was to go every morning at she was to go every evening at eight o'clock to relieve another who remained during the day, and to be extremely cautious not to speak to the young man unless it was urgently necessary. Nor was she to make any motion which might in the slightest degree disturb the few intervals of rest which he was enabled to enjoy. But she knew neither name nor the residence of the person she was to wait on. There was something unusual in all this, and I remember perfectly well my mother desiring her to call soon and let her know how she fared. But nearly six weeks had elapsed, and we had never once seen or heard of her. And when my mother at last resolved on sending to learn whether she was sick and to say she was longing to see her again. The servant on his return informed us that poor nurse had been dangerously ill and confined to her bed almost ever since she had been with us. But she was now a little better and had proposed and had purposed coming to see us the following day. She came accordingly but oh so altered in so short a time, no one would have believed it. She was almost double, and could not walk without support. Her flesh and cheeks were all shrunk, shrunk away, and her dim, lustrousless eyes almost lost in their sockets. We were all startled at seeing her. It seemed that those six weeks had produced greater changes in her than years of disease in others. But our surprise at the effect was nothing when compared to which her recital of the cause excited when she informed us of it. And as we had never known her to tell a falsehood, we could not avoid placing implicit confidence in her words. She told us that in the evening, according to appointment, the physician had conducted her to the residence of her charge in one of the narrow streets near the abbey. It was one of those extensive houses which would seem built for an eternity rather than time, and in constructing of which the founder had consulted convenience and comfort more than show or situation. A flight of high stone steps brought them to the door, and a dark staircase with to immense width fenced with balustres, balustrises, um, a foot broad, and supported by a railing of massy dimensions, led to the chamber of the patient. This was a lofty wainscoted room, with a window sunk in, sunk a yard deep in the wall, and looking out upon what was a once a garden at the rear, but now grown so wild that the weeds If I can flick the next page the weeds and rank grass almost reached the level of the wall which enclosed it. At one end stood an old-fashioned square bed, where the young gentleman lay. It was hung with faded Venetian tapestry, and seemed itself as large as a moderate-sized room. At the other end, and opposite to the foot of the bed, was a fireplace supported by ponderous stone buttresses, but with no grate and few smouldering turf were merely piled on the spacious hearth. There was no door except that by which she had entered, and no other furniture than a few low chairs and a table covered with medicines and draughts, and draughts, 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 beside the window. The oak which covered the walls and formed the panels of the ceiling was as black as time could make it, and the whole apartment, which was kept dark at the suggestion of the physician, was so gloomy that the glimmering of a single candle in the shade of the fireplace could not penetrate it. 
and I cast a faint gleam around, not sad, but absolutely sickening. Whilst the doctor was speaking in a low tone to the invalid, nurse tried to find out further particulars from the other attendant who was tying on her bonnet and preparing to muffle herself in her plait before going away. For, as I said before, it was wintry, it was winter and bitterly cold. She could gain no information from her, however, although she had been in the situation for a considerable time. She could not tell the name of the gentleman. She only knew that he was an Oxford student. But no one, save herself and the doctor, had ever crossed the threshold to inquire after him, nor had ever seen anyone in the rest of the house, which she believed to be uninhabited. The doctor and she soon went away after leaving a few unimportant directions. Nurse closed the door behind them, and shivering with the cold, frosty gust of air from a spacious lobby, hastened to her duty. Wrapped her cloak about her, drew the, her seat close to the hearth, replenished the fire, and commenced reading a volume of Mr. Alexander Peden's prophecies, which she had brought in her pocket. There was no sound to disturb her, except now and then a blast of wind which shook the withering trees in the garden below, or the death watch, which ticked incessantly in the wainscot room, a wainscot of the room. In this manner, an hour or two had elapsed when concluding from the motionless posture of the patient that he must be asleep. She rose and taking the light in her hand, moved to, on tiptoe across the polished oaken floor to take a survey of his features and appearance. She gently opened the curtains and bringing the light to bear upon him, started to find that he was still awake. She attempted to apologise for her curiosity by an awkward tender of, a, of her services, but apology and offer were equally useless. He moved neither his limb nor muscle, he made not the faintest reply, and he lay motionless on his back. His bright blue eyes glaring fixedly upon her, his underlip fallen and his mouth apart. His cheek a perfect hollow, and, in, and his long white teeth projecting fearfully from his shrunken lips, whilst his bony hand, covered with wine, wiry sinews, was stretched upon the bed's clothes. They looked more like the claw of a bird than the fingers of a human being. She felt rather uneasy whilst looking at him, but when a slight motion of the eyelids, which the light was too strong for, assured her that he was still living, which she was half inclined to doubt, she returned to her seat and her book by the fire. As she was directed not to disturb him, and as his medicine was only to be administered in the morning, she had but little to do, and the succeeding two hours passed heavily away. She continued, however, to lighten them in the, by the assistance of Mr. Peden, and, also, and by and now and then crooning and gazing over the silent flickering progress of her turf fire, till about midnight, as near as she could guess, the gentleman began to breathe heavily and appeared very uneasily. As, however, he spoke nothing, she thought he was perhaps asleep and was rising to go towards him when she was surprised to see a lady seated on a chair near the head of the bed beside him. Though somewhat startled at this, she was by no means alarmed, and, making the curtsy, was moving on as she had intended, when the lady raised her arm, and turning the palm of her hand, which was covered with a white glove towards her, motioned her silently to keep her seat. She accordingly sat down as before, but she now began to wonder within herself how and when this lady came in. It was true that she had not been looking towards the door, and it might have been opened without her perceiving it. But then it was so cold a night, and so late an hour. It was this which made it so remarkable. She turned quietly round and took a second view of her visitor. She wore a black veil over her bonnet, 
and her face was turned away towards the bed of the invalid. She could not in that gloomy chamber perceive her features, but she saw that the shape and turn of her head and neck were as graceful and elegant in the extreme. The rest of her person she could not well discern, as it was enveloped in a green silk gown, and the fashion at that period was not so favourable to display of a figure as now. It occurred to her it must have been some intimate female friend who had called in, but then the woman had told her that no visitors had ever come before. Altogether, she could not well understand the matter, but she thought she would observe whether she went off as gently as she had entered, and for that purpose she altered the position of her chair as to command a view of the door, and fixed herself with her book on her knees, but her eye intently set upon the lady in the green gown. In this position she remained for a considerable time, but no alteration took place in the room. The stranger sat evidently gazing on the face of the sick gentleman, whilst he heaved and sighed and breathed in agony, as if a nightmare were upon him. Nurse, a second time, moved towards him in order to hold him up in bed, or, by give, or give him some temporary relief, and a second time the mysterious visitant motioned her to remain quiet. And, unwillingly, but by a kind of fascination, she complied, and again commenced her watch. But her position was a painful one, and she sat so long and so quietly that the last her at last her eyes closed for a moment, and when she opened them, the lady was gone. The young man was once more composed, and after taking something to relieve his breathing, he fell into a gentle sleep, from which he had not awakened when her colleague arrived in the morning to take her place, and nurse returned to her own home about daybreak. The following night, she was again at her duty. She came rather late and found her companion already muffled and waiting impatiently to set out. She lighted her to the stairs and heard her close the hall door behind her. When, on returning to the room, the wind, as she shut the door, blew out her candle. She relighted it. However, from the dying embers, roused up the fire and resumed as before her seat, and her volume of prophecies. The night was stormy, and dry crisp sleet hissed on the window. The wind sighed in heavy gusts down the spacious chimney. Whilst the rattling of the shutters and the occasional clash of a door in some distant part of the house came with a dim and hollow echo along the dreary, silent passages. She did not feel so comfortable as the night before. The whistling of the wind through the trees made her flesh creep involuntarily, and sometimes a thundering clap of a distant door made her start and drop her book, with a sudden prayer for the protection of heaven. She was thinking within herself of giving up the engagement, and was half resolved to do so on the morrow when all at once her ear was struck with the heaving throes and agonised breathing of her charge, and on raising her head, she saw the same lady in the green gown, seated in the same position as the night before. Well, thought she, this is unusually strange, but it immediately struck her that it must be an inmate of the house, for what human being could venture out in such a dreary night and at such an hour? But then, her dress. It was neither such as one could wear in the streets of a wintry night, nor yet such as they would be likely to have on in the house at that hour. It was, in fact, a f the fashionable summer costume of the time. She rose and made her curtsy and spoke to her politely, but got no reply save the waving of her hand, by which she had been silenced before. At length the agitation of the invalid was so increased that she could not reconcile with her duty to sit still whilst the stranger was attending him. 
she accordingly drew nearer to the bed in spite of the repeated beckonings of the lady, who, as she advanced, drew her veil, her veil closer to her face and retired to the table at the side next to the window. Nurse approached the bed, but was terrified on beholding the countenance of the patient. The big drops of cold sweat were rolling down his pale brow. His livid lips were quivering with agony. And as he mentioned her side, as he motioned her aside, his glaring eyes followed the retreating figure in the green gown. She soon saw that it was in vain to attempt assisting him. He impatiently repulsed every proffer, every proffer of attention. And again, resumed, she resumed her seat, whilst the silent visitor returned to her place by his bedside. Rather piqued at being thus baffled in, the, in her intentions of kindness, but still putting her the idea of a supernatural being, the old woman again determined to watch with the attention the retreat of the lady and observe whether she resided in the house or took her departure by the main door. She almost refrained from winking in order to secure a scrutiny of her motions, but it was all in vain. She could not remember to have taken off her she could not remember to have taken off her glance for a moment, but still the visitant was gone. It seemed as if she had only changed her thoughts for an instant, and not her eyes, but that change was enough. When she again reverted the object of her anxiety, the mysterious lady had departed. As on the foregoing night, her patient now became composed, and enjoyed an uninterrupted slumber till the light of the morning. Now reflected from heaps of dazzling snow, brought with it the female, who was to relieve guard at the end of the bed of misery. The following morning, nurse went to the house of the physician who had engaged her with the determination of giving up the task in which she was employed. She felt uneasy at their thoughts of retaining it, as she had never been similarly situated before. She always had some companion to speak to, or was at least employed at in an inhabited house. But besides, she was not by any means comfortable in the visits of the nightly stranger. She was disappointed, however, by fi not finding him at the home, and was directed to return at a certain hour. As she lay down to rest in the meantime, she did not awake till that hour was long gone. Nothing then remained but to return for another night and give warning of her intention on the morrow and with a heavy discontented, discontented heart she repaired to the gloomy apartment. The physician was already there when she arrived and received her notice with regret but was rather surprised when she informed him of the attentions of the strange lady and the manner in which she had been prevented from performing her duty. He, however, treated it as a commonplace occurrence and suggested that it was an affectionate relative or a friend of the patient, of whose connection he knew nothing. At last he took his leave and nurse arranged her chair and seated herself to watch, not merely to the departure, but the arrival of her fair friend. As she had not, however, appeared on the former occasions till the night was far advanced, she did not expect her sooner and endeavour to occupy her attention till that time by some other means. But it was all in vain. She could only think of the one mysterious circumstance, fix her dim gaze on the blackened trellis work of the ceiling and start at every trifling sound, which was now doubly audible as all without was hushed by the noiseless snow in which the streets were embedded. Again, however, her vigilance was eluded, and as, wearied with thought, she raised her head with a long-drawn sigh and a yawn of fatigue, she encountered the green garments of her unsolicited companion. Angry with herself, and at the time, at the same time unwilling, 
to accuse herself of remissness. She determined once again that she should not escape unnoticed. There hung a feeling of awe around her whenever she approached the singular being, and when, as before, the lady retired to another quarter of the room, as she approached the bread, she did, had not courage to follow her. Again, the same distressing scene of suffering in her unfortunate charge ensued. He gasped and heaved until the noise of his agony made her heart sicken within her. When she drew near his bed, his corpse-like features were convulsed with a feeling of which seemed to twist their relaxed nerves into the most fearful expression, whilst his ghastly eyes were straining from their sunken sockets. She spoke, but he answered not. She touched him, but he was cold with terror and unconscious of any object, save the one mysterious being whom his glance followed with awful intensity. I have often heard my mother say that Nurse was naturally a woman of very strong feelings, but here she was, totally beside herself, with anxiety. She thought that the young gentleman was just expiring, and was preparing to leave the room in search of farther assistance, when she saw the lady again move towards the bed of the dying man. She bent above him for a moment, whilst his writhings were indescribable, she then moved towards the door. Now was the moment. Nurse advanced at the same time, laid her one hand on the latch, whilst the other, whilst with the other, she attempted to raise the veil of the stranger. And in the next instant, Nurse fell lifeless on the floor. As she had glanced in the face of the lady, she saw that a lifeless head filled the bonnet. Its vacant sockets and ghastly teeth were all that could be seen beneath the folds of the veil. Daylight was breaking the following morning when the other attendant arrived and found the poor old woman cold and benumbed stretched upon the floor beside the passage. And when she looked upon the bed of the invalid, he lay stiffened and lifeless, as if many hours had elapsed since his spirit had shaken off its mortal coil. One hand was thrown across his eyes as if to shade them from some object on which he had feared to look, and the other grasped the coverlet with convulsive firmness. The remains of the mysterious student were interred into Old Colton burying ground, and I remember before the new road was made through it to have often seen his grave. But I never could learn his name, what connection the spirit had with this story, or how he came to be in that melancholy, deserted situation in Edinburgh. I have mentioned at the commencement of this narration that I will vouch for its truth as far as regards myself, that is merely that I heard the poor old woman, the nurse, herself tell all the extraordinary circumstances as I have recited them a very few weeks before her death. She never recovered from the effects of the terror and pined and wasted away to the hour of her death, which followed in about two months after that fearful occurrence. For my part, I firmly believe all she told us. And though my father, who came home the spring following, used to say it was all a dream with effects of imagination, I always saw too many concurrent circumstances attending to it to permit me to think so. So that was um, A Tale for Twilight. Um, I personally quite like that story. I um, only discovered it the other day, to be fair, because I had bought this book just so I could have a look at some ghost stories. Um, I hope that you enjoyed it and do let me know what you think. I had this as a, a request from quite a few people. So I hope that you enjoyed my my narration boys <laughs> um anyway i hope you've all had a good halloween and that although this is a relatively creepy story that it's helped you relax to some degree and i will speak to you all again soon um happy halloween and until next time bye bye for now